Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to the Keto Answers Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin, and joining me this week is Dr. Thomas Seyfried. Doc here um, blew my mind. There was a lot of information in this one. He has done so much work in the field of cancer and using ketogenic diet for cancer. Started researching epilepsy and seizures, and that brought him to using ketogenic diet and a whole bunch of different things to treat cancer. Uh, his, his approach is very, very different from standard of care. He does not think that anybody should be using what he calls poison um, chemotherapy for cancer treatment, and he thinks that there's a much, much better way. So if you were interested in that, um, I was, obviously. So take a pen and paper and get it out. There's a lot of notes here. So many people are affected by this stuff. Um, cancer rates, I know we've mentioned this in a previous episode, are... One in two in men in the U.S. now, and one in three in women. So, I mean, something that's just critically important. We're, we're not solving that problem. So, people like Dr. Safer here are, are a huge part of the puzzle to try to move it in the right direction. So, tune in, and I hope you enjoy. Before we get to the episode, I wanted to chat about our sponsor, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto is all about making a ketogenic diet healthy and accessible. Whether you're reading all of our online guides or articles, or enjoying Perfect Keto's exogenous ketones, or any other keto-friendly products, everything you need to make keto work for you is at perfectketo.com. I know what you're thinking. Hey, aren't you the founder of Perfect Keto? Yep, that's right. And all of my insanely high standards have been put into making each and every product. My background as a functional medicine clinician helps me craft the cleanest and healthiest possible products and the best information about the ketogenic diet. Head on over to perfectketo.com to learn anything you need to know about the ketogenic diet. And if you've never tried any of our products before, feel free to use the code Keto Podcast for 20% off your first order. With that being said, let's get into the show. Doc, thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Before we go into some of probably a little bit more uh, in-depth topics here, I just wanted to take a step back and chat about your background and what makes you so qualified in this topic. Yeah, well, you know, I'm a professor at Boston College. Uh, I was, I've been here now for about 33 years. And before that, I was at Yale University Department of Neurology for nine years. Um, and I took that position as assistant uh, postdoc and then assistant professor after having received my PhD from the University of Illinois um, in, in, in biochemical genetics. So we have done a lot of work in the field of epilepsy in um, neurodegenerative diseases like uh, lipid storage diseases, Tay-Sachs disease. Um, and then of course we have been working on, on the issue of cancer metabolism um, and biochemistry uh, parallel parallel with all these uh, other other studies that we do. Great. And so, what I mean, how did you go from from studying epilepsy to cancer? Is it just something that sort of popped up as a big problem to solve, or like what was the path that led you to that focus? Well, I mean, we we had been studying cancer parallel with epilepsy, but for different different fundamental reasons. Our, goal, our work in cancer was mostly looking at um, the, the changes in, in cell surface carbohydrates related to the migration or invasion of tumor cells, um, where the work on epilepsy was we were in the process of mapping genes and looking at gene environmental interactions. It, the, 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 the emerging of the two came when one of my students um, requested to attend a meeting um, in, in Seattle, Washington on ketogenic diets for epilepsy. And, um, you know, I had been aware of ketogenic diets for epilepsy, you know, for a long time. I mean, th this is not a, a new field. It's, it was started back in 1921 by Wilder at Mayo Clinic. Um, but for the most part, people were not excited about ketogenic diets uh, for anything. Um, until um, Jim Abrams uh, and the Charlie Foundation, his son Charlie had seizures and almost died. And then there was a small group at Johns Hopkins University that are friends of mine, Jim Freeman, the late Jim Freeman, uh, and his associates were, were working with ketogenic diets for epilepsy. And of course, we had, a, we had one of the best epilepsy uh, models in, in the mouse. So one of my students on, in a PhD project says, why don't we try to figure out how the, epi how the ketogenic diet works for, to, if we could manage seizures in this particular mouse that we had. Um, so I sent her out there and, and she met Jim Abrams and, and this was like the beginning of the Charlie Foundation's organization. And then Meryl Streep had done the, the movie, uh, First Do No Harm, um, uh, which was put on by Jim Abrams in, in honor of his son Charlie to try to, to try to bring the world attention to this. Um, 
And, you know, when when my student, Mariana uh, uh, Totrodova, came back to the lab, she said, oh, we have to do this ketogenic diet stuff in the epilepsy. And um, we didn't put it on the cancer models until we realized that the um, that a, a major way the ketogenic diet works is through calorie restriction. And we knew that calorie restriction could also um, uh, reduce tumor growth. So we kind of merged the two together. Um, you know, we were first interested in what calorie restriction might do to the to the lipid uh, profiles of the tumor cells, and then we began to realize that calorie restriction, just the restriction, just cutting back the amount of calories that the mouse ate, uh, had powerful um, effects on the growth of the tumor. So we kind of shifted away from from epilepsy. I mean, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how ketogenic diets could manage epileptic seizures. So we were deep into the biochemical mechanisms, and we still really don't know to this day the exact mechanisms by which ketogenic diets can stop seizures. We just know that it's probably one of the most powerful ways to stop epileptic seizures. A lot of it has to do with the levels of glucose and the levels of ketones. Do you, but do you the, have any leading theories as far as what you think the mechanism is? Well, I, I think... Um, we don't we don't really know um, because the neurons are uh, and how they work um, uh, electrically is is a very complicated complicated situation. We knew one thing, and we published a major paper to show that the that the therapeutic success of ketogenic diets for epilepsy were based largely on maintaining a a lower stable glucose level. And uh, we published this, and uh, and many of my friends in the epilepsy field began to very carefully monitor glucose levels in their in their clinical patient uh, young people population, and they found that if you can keep blood sugars low and stable, seizures in most of the children were 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 managed. But every now and then, the child would grab a coke or a, a piece of cake or bread or whatever, and it would send the sugar high, and they would have breakthrough seizures. Almost so you could manage a child for months, and then all of a sudden that you, that child could have a breakthrough seizure within within minutes, uh, you know, several minutes, a half an hour of having consumed some sugary um, um, drink or food. So clearly, the, the long term benefit was like wiped out immediately. And uh, but then of course the child would bring the glu glucose down, and the and the seizures would be modified. And you know we did all a lot of these basic research uh, findings in the mouse. So we were quite aware of the role of sugar, glucose, actually, and 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 ketones. Um, you know, what is, was it the elevation of ketones, the lowering glucose? And of course, what are the, the the neurochemical mechanisms involved? And that's still under a very active investigation. Has has there been any research done where levels of ketone ketones have been available in the bloodstream while a, a spike in glucose has been there? Yeah, and that that was one of the things that. Um, that it, it, it didn't clear the key uh, when the, when the, when the child took the drink, it didn't clear ketones out of the blood, uh, as quickly, uh, as, as the elevation in glucose. So, um, you know, you have insulin surge, you know, you, you're, you're under a low, a, a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet and you're very, you're extremely insulin sensitive. So when you take the sugar, you know, um, insulin, you know, goes right up real quick. And, uh, you know, that could be one of the participatory, uh, events in the breakthrough seizure. We're, we're, we're not really sure um, of all the details, but as I said, this is a very active uh, area of investigation, but you didn't wipe out all the ketones. So, and this is what we came later to realize in cancer, the same, um, you know, it takes a while for the body to flush out the ketones. I mean, it can happen over a period of hours, but generally the ketones are still present. Um, so, so we were well, I, I wrote a big review article on the mechanisms by which ketogenic diets could stop seizures. And, you know, we had been involved in a lot of this. So our background was clearly in, um, how ketogenic diets might be managing, um, uh, uh, epilepsy. And then, um, but you know, at the same time, we began to shift these same kinds of diets over to cancer. Um, and, and the mechanism for managing cancer is so much more clear and understandable than it is for how these, mm. how this meta, ketogenic metabolic therapy works for epilepsy. So, uh, the cancer becomes clearly a disease that can be effectively managed and actually reduced, prevented, uh, by this same mechanism that manages seizure, but the same, the same, um, approach 
the mechanisms are very different, but the approach is, is similar. Right. So during your research, is that when you came to the conclusion and, and sort of planted your flag in the ground, wrote your book, Cancer is Metabolic Disease, or did you have that viewpoint before you started this research? No, I mean, I, when I, I, I had no, we, we had not worked um, deeply in the cancer field as, as far as management. We, we were doing years of basic research on lipid biochemistry and cancer cells, which called basic research you know, what role do gangliosides play in, in the growth of the tumor? We weren't looking, um, uh, we, we had some drugs that we're going to, we're going, that, in fact, this is one of the, the main linkages is that we found a drug that could block gangliocide biosynthesis, um, and, and in the, in the, in the brains of Tay-Sachs disease mice, um, and in our cancer work, we showed that this same drug could really block gangliocide biosynthesis. So we said, whoa, you know, this might be a connection. So we fed the mice this drug. And sure enough, uh, um, the gangliocides and the tumors went down, but the tumors shrunk tremendously. So the company that was interested in this drug um, supported our research for $200,000 to do a pilot study on how this on how this drug might be um, reducing the tumor growth. Was it through ganglioside? Was it through a biochemical mechanism or what? But then we found that this drug um, caused the mice to lose weight. As a matter of fact, the drug blocked the ability of the digestive system to, to metabolize food. So the food was kind of collecting in the, in the gut of these mice, in the stomach and the intestines. And the mice were actually uh, getting an indirect calorie restriction. They were eating. They were eating the food, but they couldn't digest it because the drug was was blocked was blocking sucrases in the gut that need, are needed to break down uh, digi digest food. So um, you know, we didn't know at the time. We didn't know what was going on. And then I said, one of my one of my colleagues said, let's put a put a control group in there. Let's restrict the food intake in these mice to match what the drug the body weight reduction that the drug was causing. And it turned out that they both shrunk the tumor to the exact same degree. So the drug, the drug had nothing to do with uh, any kind of a sexy biochemical mechanism. It was just causing the mice not to be able to digest the food they ate. So it was clear that the, the drug was working through an indirect calorie restriction. Got it, got it, got it. And so at this point, um, moving over, is that when you sort of had the aha moment start pulling the thread a little bit more here? Yeah, well, then we said, you know, what could be causing this? And we went back and we found that Otto Warburg had said a long time ago that, you know, these cancer cells depend on glucose. And, and if you, and if you, you know, if you, if you target glucose or try to, try to do that, uh, what they, he was more interested in, you know, how, how cancer cells were growing. And it turned out to be a glucose mediated mechanism. And when you do calorie restriction or therapeutic fasting, you're lowering blood sugar. And, um, and, and, and we were able to link this very, very carefully to show that there was a direct correlation, uh, between how much blood, how much sugar was in the blood and how fast the tumors grew. And now this is, we were the first to do this, this that now has been established for all kinds of human cancers. As I said, most human cancers, if you want them to grow fast, you get your blood sugar up as high as you can. Insulin and, and sugar drive those tumors like crazy. And when you do calorie restriction or fasting, you lower insulin and blood sugar. And that that's connected to. Uh, a reduced rate of, of tumor growth. So, so you can see that, and then we began to look more into what Otto Warburg had actually said. And, uh, we, we, we looked at his papers in German and English, and we just went through the whole thing. And, and then we began to find that all of the things that he, he had defined were in fact correct. Um, and but most recently we just published a paper with my colleague, um, uh, Christo Shinopoulos from the Semmelweis university in Budapest, Hungary, showing that the we've we've dis, we've identified the missing link in Warburg's central theory and that is they can also ferment an amino, amino acids and especially glutamine mm. so the cancer cell is simply now we know is simply a fermenting or, uh, um, uh, cell ferments and if you target the two fermentable fuels you can eliminate the tumor cells right. and so for people who aren't familiar with Otto Warburg and his work, um, how would you, maybe for somebody who doesn't really understand a lot or has maybe a concept that is ingrained in most people's heads that um, cancer is just a DNA damage thing. And once the DNA gets, gets damaged, the cell proliferates indefinitely. Um, so this is sort of a different way to look at it. Well, it's, you know, we have now shown through nuclear transfer experiments and all kinds of other things that the DNA damage is a downstream effect. It's not the cause. 
So we know that now, although to be honest with you, um, that's a very, very difficult pill or piece of information to swallow on the part of a vast um, uh, academic pharmaceutical industry that banked their whole existence onto this DNA um, information, which now we know is is um, is wrong, fundamentally wrong, um, because the evidence that we have now to show that cancer is a mitochondrial metabolic disease is overwhelming for those that actually want to look at the research. Um, the bottom line is that Otto Warburg was absolutely correct in defining cancer as a metabolic disease. The problem is he did not know about amino acid fermentation. And that's the missing link in, the, in Warburg's theory. And that missing link led to significant confusion for decades. And it was never clearly recognized because many of the enzymes in the systems were not identified during War, Warburg's time. So, so there was a lot of confusion about you know, whether it was purely glucose or, or something else because people had found cancer cells that um, did not respond to glucose restriction. And they said, see, Otto Warburg must be wrong. Um, and that led to confusion. And then, and then of course, um, when the genetic revolution occurred and they found all these broken chromosomes and mutations in the tumor cell DNA, everybody ran down that path in a, in a, in a, in a herd. You know, it's called group think. And, um, and then that was so exciting to see all these mutations in cancer cells leading people to believe that that was the origin, when in fact now we have shown and others that it's all downstream epiphenomena. When you, when you damage the respiration, they throw out all these reactive oxygen species, which lead to the damage of, of, of DNA. So the reactive oxygen species are carcinogenic and mutagenic. So consequently, everybody, uh, so many people in the cancer field were simply studying effects rather than causes. And as the result of that, uh, of, of that endeavor, the results of that endeavor is that we have today 1,600 people a day in the United States die from cancer. And they're dying because the field is focusing on things that aren't relevant to the nature of the disease. Right. And so it's sort of like if you had a fire in your house, but you had sprinklers that put the fi- it was trying to put the fire out and your basement flooded. And so you say it's a problem with the leaky water line. Let's, let's try to get these buckets out of here and not understanding the fire and why it's there. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, you know, analogies and things that we can, that we can link to this whole problem, but, but, you know, and then of course we have the phenomenon of what we call escalating situations because we have involved and in, invested so many hundreds of billions of dollars into this approach of, of cancer as a genetic disease and, and the infrastructures that we've built in the major academic institutions and pharma, pharmaceutical companies, um, to, to, to say that, 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 that effort is largely misplaced despite we've just invested so much in this, we have to keep going. Um, that's what we call an escalating situation. You throw, in other words, you throw good money after bad and you keep doing that because you have already invested so much in this whole process. And then to realize that this is the wrong, the wrong route, the wrong direction, the wrong road, uh, is just, it's just too difficult for the majority of people working in the field to accept. Right. And so just to break it down, if we didn't cover this very clearly with, for people who may not have picked this up, but the, the thought is that the cancer cell now is basically running on two different fuel sources and has a different fuel supply than, and it has different instructions from the cell is it now what would be causing that? And what would be the sort of the, you, you said earlier, there's a way where we can have some prevention as well as treatment. What are the things that are causing this in the first place to get to this point? Yeah, well, th- so can, this was called the oncogenic paradox, actually first first defined by um, Albert St. Georgi, a Nobel Prize winner back in 1979. He, he, that was his problem. He said, you know, what is going on here? He says, you can, you can get cancer from so many different in different ways, you know, viral infection, systemic inflammation, radiation, carcino- carcinogens, chemicals that we are known to cause cancer. But there was no common linkage by any of these provocative agents, an underlying common link. Um, and what we have done was we've shown that that common link is damage to the mitochondria in a particular population, a particular population of cells in a particular organ. So 
you know, someone could be exposed to a chemical carcinogen and that person may get, you know, a liver cancer where the same carcinogen might give somebody else a kidney cancer. The bottom line is the carcinogen is causing cancer by damaging mitochondria in some cells of, uh, of an organ and, and, and those cells then begin to uh, ferment. Uh, so if the respiration is damaged by the chemical carcinogen, in order to stay alive, the cell must transfer transition its energy from an oxidative state, breathing air and getting energy through oxidative phosphorylation, or, or ferment. And as Warburg said, if the, if, the, if the insult is too acute, if it's too strong, cells die. And you can't get cancer cells from dead cells. So the, the, so the damage to the respiration by a carcinogen or whatever has to be gradual so that the cell has the capability of transitioning energy away from oxidative phosphorylation to fermentation. Now, fermentation metabolism existed on the planet before oxygen came into the atmosphere. So basically, these cancer cells are simply falling back on ancient pathways that existed before oxygen came into the, to the atmosphere. And, and, this is the, and they enter a default state, which is proliferation. So the mitochondria are such an important organelle. They keep the cell healthy and they keep the cell in a differentiated, stable state. And when that organelle becomes damaged, the cells fall back on fermentation and that leads them to proliferate just, the day, just as they did before oxygen came into the atmosphere. All cells on the planet were highly proliferative uh, using a fermentation metabolism before oxygen came into the atmosphere some two and a half billion years ago. So basically the cancer cell is simply falling back on these, on these ancient metabolic pathways and the results are, are, met, are unbridled proliferation. And if you pull the plug on the fermentable fuels, which are primarily glucose and glutamine, the cells die. Right. So the right. whole the whole system becomes not that complicated. And so obviously this is you know there's two separate conversations that I think someone can have when when they're thinking about this type of stuff. One is treatment, and I think that you've done a lot of work in that arena. Um, but another one is maybe just asking the question: Then, if mitochondrial dysfunction is what leads this in the first place, what have we done in this field as far as researching mitochondrial health and how to promote it? Uh, we've done very little. Um, you know, we all know that if we if we uh, diet and exercise and don't smoke and don't drink and all this kind of stuff, I mean, we we're, we're supposed to get a lot healthier. We we reduce risks, um, but we don't. We not every we live in a in a risky environment. All of us, every one of us on the planet, we live in a risky environment. And we make decisions uh, about things. And as I've written in my book, it, the, the the to re significantly reduce the risk of cancer, you reduce risk of damage to your mitochondria. Um, now sometimes we can do that. Um, you know, I'm not sure if, you know, viral infections, you know, hepatitis C virus and papilloma viruses and these things, you know, they, they, you, they enter your body and they damage mitochondria and you can get liver cancer or different kinds of, different kinds of cancers from viral infections. And I, I, I but again, it comes through the mitochondria. So I, if you avoid, if you can avoid viral infections, you can avoid cancers caused by, by, by viruses. Um, you, you, you know, if you avoid being exposed to radiation, you can, you can avoid uh, the damage that radiation would do to mitochondria in a particular population of cells. If you can avoid systemic inflammation. All right. So there's a link between, uh, obesity and inflammation and cancer. I mean, this is very clear. People know about this. So you'd say, well, how do I reduce systemic inflammation? Well, you, you reduce blood sugar, blood sugar, sustains inflammation and inflammation can damage respiration in a population of cells. We can go down through the entire list. Now, one thing we can't really do too much about is age and cancer is more prominent in older people than younger people. And just being on the planet for many decades puts you at risk for damage to respiration in a particular population of cells. But, but there are ways that you can enhance the function of your mitochondria. And that's one of them is burning ketones. So how do you burn ketones? Well, you go under fasting or you take low carbohydrate diets. All that will reduce risk to damage to mitochondria. Right. You know, it's just this pers personal choice. And I think it's, it's so confusing for so many people because this is not an area of health that we typically focus on. There are so many things that can affect it and there are no ways to assess it really. Um, I mean, there's a fringe way you can kind of approximate mitochondrial function, but there's not really any like, you, you know, it's not like you can go in like a uh, people try to get blood work and it says, oh, your mitochondria are functioning, uh, you know, X percent. 
Yeah, but you can you you can use the glucose ketone index to to get it as a biomarker to put to know whether or not your health uh, the, whether your mitochondria are going to be burning ketones or not, um, and that's what we published the paper on that. Okay. So, and so can, can you explain? So, for people who don't understand glucose ketone index, it's basically just a very easy proxy where you divide um, glucose by ketones. Um, and the, so, you're saying that this is sort of a way to approximate mitochondrial function and not just metabolism and, how, and what fuel sources you're using? Yeah, it's well, it's an indirect way because we know that when mitochondria burn ketones, the amount of reactive oxygen species that they produce is significantly lower. And we also get more what we call energetic bang for the buck. And this was all worked out in a very sophisticated biochemical uh, procedures by, by Richard Veach at the National Institutes of Health and um, uh, a number of other individuals. But when mitochondria burn ketones, they, they get healthy. And uh, they get healthy because they, they're more energetic and they produce fewer of these reactive oxygen species uh, uh, during their metabolism. So that in itself basically delays entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, uh, which is disorder. So by burning ketones, you reduce metabolic disorder and therefore keep the system at a higher rate of efficiency. Um, you know, and you can use the glucose ketone index as a means to, to know this. So, um, and a lot of, a number of people are on the web, you know, looking at their GK, we call it the GKI. So if you have a GKI, glucose ketone index, so you simply measure there's meters now that are available from Precision Extra and Keto Mojo that you can buy them on through Amazon. And, and they give you, uh, one strip will tell you what, what the glucose is and another strip will tell you what the ketones are. And, it, and of course, the glucose comes in the form of milligrams per deciliter, whereas the ketones come in millimolar. People say, wow, what's going on? Well, you, you have to make a division and bring them both to millimolar, and then you can get the ratio. But Which there's actually- dividing the glucose by 18, roughly. Yes, yes. It's not a ter it's so simple, but some people get flustered. Um, Keto Mojo just built a meter now, which converts the glucose and into a GKI uh, right away. So you just push the button and you get your number. And- um, so that makes the division, you don't even need to divide by 18 anymore for glucose. So, so you can just push the button and you can get your GKI. And a child, people are challenged. They say, oh, wow, how, how healthy can you get? Let me see what your GKI is. You know, and, and you, or you can do it by therapeutic fasting. You know, you just stop eating. It, it's not easy. I believe, believe me, I'm not sitting here telling people, hey, just go out. And, I mean, but that's the best way to get your blood sugar down and your ketones up. Um, as a species, you know, we evolved to starve. Our existence on this planet was because we could go long periods of time without food. We, we, we evolved in a very food restricted environment, unlike what we've had, what we have today. And we have all these, you know, these degenerative diseases linked to the abundance of poorly nutritious, high carbohydrate foods. It's killing, it's killing and making so many of us sick. But, you know, we didn't evolve in that kind of an atmosphere. We were always had low GKIs through our, our evolutionary past, okay. you know, but now, some people say, well, I, I want to go back to the old days, the, the, the ancient period. What, how would I get my G? What would I need to do? Well, you know, you can avoid, you know, carbohydrate foods and you can bring your sugars down and your ketones up with exercise. And, and then you measure your GKI, you know, and we said if you could get it near one, um, 1 1.0, I mean, you're really in therapeutic ketosis and that state will keep your mitochondria very healthy and that will reduce significantly your, your risk for not only cancer, but, you know, uh, other chronic diseases, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes. You can cure type 2 diabetes with metabolic therapy. You don't need any drugs. Right. So right. they just have to bite the bullet on personal discipline. <laughs> I mean, so, that's just so, for example, for when people – I, I talk to a lot of people about this type of stuff, and I think the, a lot of your research shows that a lot of the therapy, like you said, is around 1.0. And I see a lot of people when they start a ketogenic diet, they have their ketones ramp up, but then as they become more efficient at burning them, it goes out of their bloodstream and they, the ketones go into their cells and actually are utilized for energy more. So is there sort of a, a proxy for when people dip off of that and go down? So for instance, like if, I, if I've been on a ketogenic diet for and working out, doing a lot of strength training, especially for months at a time, my millimolar of uh, BHB in my blood is, is you know roughly 0.8 to 1, whereas if I... And switching back and forth in and out of ketosis often going back in my levels would be higher because my body's not used to using that as energy is there any sort of proxy there that you've seen or change um, over time when people get actually keto adapted yeah well that's certainly the case i mean 
my, my colleague, Dom D'Agostino is, is always experimenting with these kinds of situations. And, you know, he's, he's pretty much in ketosis all the time. Um, but it can up and down like you've, like you've indicated, uh, it, it can vary, but your body does become adapted and becomes much more energetically efficient. Um, cells just over time, it's like getting in shape, you know, so you always say, well, well, you know, I got to run a marathon. Well, I got to get in shape. Well, if you're going to do, you know, therapeutic ketosis, it takes time. Um, it, it takes, it takes time for the body to readjust to these new, these new physiological states, but at least you have the GKI as kind of a biomarker to let you know, uh, where, where you were and, and, and where you need mm. to go. Got it. It's with more of a trend to, than an yeah. absolute number. So and, for, and, I'm and just that, assuming like, people, maybe they're, they're hearing this and they, go, they say, oh man, I want to prevent cancer as much as possible. I want to get my GK out of one. I mean, is this the, the best thing that they can focus on? Well, I think it's the easiest thing they can focus Got on. It. it also is a challenge. And they also know how difficult it might be. Just like someone would say, I think I want to run a marathon, a Boston marathon. Well, well, you're not just going to go out without practice and just run the marathon. You know, you're, you're going to be really dragging. So, um, but I think with some degree of practice, you can get your GKIs down into these zones. You, you, you got, you, you find the foods that will, that will, um, maintain low, low carbs into your body and your body gradually starts to pick up the, the keto, the ketosis. I just want to point out though, that for normal, healthy folks, um, uh, you can get into these zones pretty pretty, um, uh, easily. I want to say, I don't want to know. I don't want to say easy. You, you can get into these zones with not extreme difficulty on uh, the cancer patient. On the other hand, has far greater difficulty getting into these zones than, than normal healthy people. And a lot of that has to do with what we found with, um, with anxiety, fear factors, um, some of the, the treatments they're on and all these kinds of things. It prevents it, it keeps glucose high. You know, you'd be stress, yeah, emotion, stress keeps blood sugar high. It's so hard for the cancer patients to get into these so-called, uh, really healthy therapeutic ketosis zones, especially if they're being treated with radiation and chemo and, and these kinds of things. It really puts so much stress on the body. It becomes a Herculean effort to get into these healthy states. Not that they can't, it's just that it requires far more uh, persistence and effort, um, than it would be for a healthy person. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I haven't even thought about that condition much. I, I wear continuous blood glucose monitor pretty often. And even when I'm stressed at work, my average of can, can jump by 20 points for a whole day or two days. Yeah. And so, yeah. and that's just me working. That's not me uh, grappling with the fact that I have cancer and I don't know what, what to do. And I'm under all this physical stress as well. Um, and then, so kind of bridging the gap here, I'm uh, talking about the setting the stage for, Prevention is just treating your mitochondria right, keeping that healthy. It's entirely different discussion. A huge problem that you're focusing on as well is the treatment. And okay, now let's say you do have some of these mitochondria that have now transitioned over a long period of time into cancerous cells that are proliferating. Uh, th the question then is, what do we do to stop this proliferation? And so at this point, probably how you would describe it, and correct me if I'm off base here, is that we have we have to look at the fuel system. So how is this? How is this mass growing? How is it moving? Well, obviously you need energy input to have an output of growth, right? And so you're you're saying that you know Warburg showed that glucose in was a was a big fuel source, but we were sort we were sort of missing something. And now you're saying that glutamine is another way that we can use this and, and ferment glutamine itself as far as pushing the growth forward. And yeah, is this, I mean, is this where you're where you're at? Yeah, that that's exactly where we're at. So. We just published a big paper in communications biology, my, my chief associate, Dr. Perna Mukherjee, where we targeted simultaneously glucose and glutamine. You need drugs to target glutamine because it's not, it's not, you can't manage it effectively with yeah. diet. So actually before, before we dip into to the, those new findings, when people now are on ketogenic diet, I think they understand that you, your blood glucose doesn't drop to zero. Like, you know, your GKI doesn't go to infinity. And so... The question at that point is that, you know, are you going to have through a bunch of different processes in your body's gluconeogenesis and in, in others, you're going to have some glucose around, but that doesn't go to zero. So the concern to have glucose as a fuel, I mean, is this why, for instance, resistance training is, is so great when undergoing treatment of cancer, because it's sort of upregulates the like glute four transporters and creates a glucose sink and pulls it away from the cancer cells or how do we, how do we shift the balance of fuel? Yeah. 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 We probably published that. Yeah. I, I, I showed that because when, when you start to, to reduce the, the sugar for the body, 
um, normal cells uh, uh, compete now directly uh, with, with the cancer cells. So you, you're using your normal cells as part of this, as part of the solution to the problem. For the first time, you're asking normal cells of your body to to come together and uh, and uh, upregulate glucose. Because we did that, we put mice on on some of these very restricted glucose conditions. And we saw an elevation of glu glu transporters in the normal cells go up when we uh, significantly real. So that means they're, they're, they're now they're in direct competition with the tumor cell. They, the normal cells can burn either ketones or glucose. The, the tumor cell can only burn the glucose. So, so you're, you're, you're competing, the normal cells are competing for the fuel that will keep the tumor cells alive. But the normal cells can also burn the ketones, so they can stay alive using either glucose or ketones. So would you, would you, in that sense, though, want the ketones a little bit lower, so that way your body puts to use and outcompetes the cancer cells for glucose? Um, well, the, these are very good questions, and this is where the cutting edge is right now when I'm working with my, my clinician colleagues in translating the information that we have from the research in the, in the, in the lab with the animals. Um, and how we transition these different uh, different strategies to to people, um, and you know how low can you how low should you push your blood sugar? How high should you push your ketones? Um, at, at you know for how long? Uh, we we don't only use this. Let me let me start by saying the first thing we do, the first thing we we would like to do in the clinic when someone would be would be diagnosed with any kind of a cancer is we do a comprehensive blood work because it turns out that many people with cancer. Uh, also have many other metabolic imbalances. It's unbelievable. So um, they're, you know, if you look at their blood work, a lot of things are out of whack. You know, LDL, HDL, triglycerides. You know, you can have C-reactive protein, your ferritin levels. You know, all these different kinds of levels are are, are indicators of overall health status. And not uh, and many times, not always, but we see some cancer patients are all out of whack with these biomarkers. So so biomarkers of health, of course. So we, we have to know where the individual is before we, where, where we know to where we are going. So as we first transition this individual off the high sugar and all this other stuff, he brings the, the whole body into a new state of health. Now that already will shrink tumors and that will already slow down cancer growth. Once we get the person into therapeutic ketosis, uh, then we begin to go after the glutamine and we begin to put uh, maximum metabolic stress uh, on the tumor. That's why we use hyperbaric oxygen. My, my colleague, Dom D'Agostino, was really big on this. We can kill tumor cells using excessive oxidative stress rather than radiation. So once you pull away the fermentable fuels that protect the tumor cell from radiation and chemo, now they become extremely vulnerable to oxidative stress created by hyperbaric oxygen. Okay. And so, so would, would you, for instance, do like a three-day fast going into that and then go aggressive at the end of the fast with hyperbaric oxygen? Or like, what, what is the... Protocol. Well, what we think, yeah, what we think the protocol will be is, is, is what we do is we, we transition the patient first off to a low carbohydrate diet before we do therapeutic fasting. It's the transition from a low carb diet, uh, or a ketogenic diet into water only therapeutic fasting. The transition is much easier than going the reverse. You know, there's going cold Turkey on the food. It's very, very hard. Yeah, it's brutal. After three days, man, you're, you're, you're ready to chew, chew paint. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's not, it's not easy. So, but the transition going from say, okay, well, I'm eating a, a balanced, you know, carbohydrate diet and whatever. So you gradually reduce the carbs to almost uh, as low as you possibly can get for maybe a week or more. And then uh, you can see the blood sugar going down and the ketones going up. So the pe person is naturally going into a, into a state of therapeutic ketosis. And then you can do a water only fast for a few days and, the, and it becomes far, far less uh, ta uh, 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 stressful on the body. Then once the person is in this good state of therapeutic ketosis, then we can start hammering the glutamine. We use drugs for that and hyperbaric oxygen. And the goal, of course, is to gradually degrade the tumor slowly while maintaining a high health status of the body and, and an overall quality of life. So at no time should this patient have to suffer any kind of a very toxic uh, approach, you know, there's like, we, we're, we're eliminating the toxic effects and we're keeping these people very healthy. And we, and we want these people to emerge from the treatment far healthier than when they started. Not like death warmed over like you see today with the treatments they're giving these poor people. So we're, we're, the goal is to stop the proliferation of cells that are fundamentally fermenting. And, you know, we don't need radiation or chemo 
uh, toxic chemo to do that. We just have to know how to pull the strings on the metabolism of the cell, but you have to do it gradually so you don't cause any harm or toxicity yeah. to the yeah, so, so you're saying, okay, so we have glucose and glutamine. So glucose, we talked about strength training can pull some uh, stuff in there, switching to a low carbohydrate diet. And mm -hmm. then anything else that you would recommend as far as lifestyle changes that could help balance the glucose from the, the cancer cells to the, the rest of the body? Well, I mean, I think we use, we use uh, the ambiguity here comes when people say, can I eat this? Can I do that? Can I do this? You know, and everybody has a different story because we're all physiologically a little bit different from each other. And I, I, we use the GKI uh, indexes to let people know. It's like some guy can eat something and it really throws the index out of whack. And another guy can eat the same thing. It doesn't do anything. Right. So, uh, so every individual is unique and they have to have their own meter. They look at their own data and they share that with their, uh, with their healthcare provider that understands what, what's going on. And, um, you know, Miriam Kalamian, who you said you interviewed, you know, she's helped so many, so many cancer patients you know, maintain in this so-called therapeutic zone. And, um, you know, and we're developing the kinds of drugs um, that would work together uh, with the metabolic state to destroy these tumor cells. So it's, it's not just one approach what we have here. We have a entire metabolic uh, reconfiguration of the body that will involve uh, dietary changes used together with procedures and drugs that target and kill the tumor cells in a non-toxic way. And we are absolutely convinced that this works. We've seen it work um, in many, many different patients with all kinds of different cancers. In fact, as I said, cancer is a singular disease. It's not a hundred diseases. If you have bladder cancer, colon cancer, brain cancer, breast cancer, the cells are all fermenting and, they, and the most abundant fuels are glucose and glutamine. So the strategy to kill cancer is not that complicated. It, and, and many people simply can't believe that because of the enormous investment we have made in the approaches that we're using today, making right. it seem like it's infinitely complicated. And it is when you look at it from a genetic perspective, but when you look at it from a metabolic perspective, it's a very simple disease. So the, the, the recent thought you had about glutamine being a, f a fuel source here, is it something that it pref the cancer cell would prefer glucose. And then once you start taking that away with low carbohydrate diets and all these other things we talked about, then it starts hedging more towards glutamine as a more readily available fuel source or how does it choose? Or is it sort of an amb ambiguous process? No, it's, it's, it, first of all, the cancer cell doesn't, doesn't prefer anything. Uh, it, it just uses what's available in the environment to fuel, to fuel the fermentation because without fermentation, it's, it's, it's dead. So and as a matter of fact, it just comes down to ener basic energy. You know, without energy, nothing can live. So, uh, so every, every cell uh, acquires energy um, through the process of, um, of metabolism. You, you either get it from, from glucose through oxidative phosphorylation in normal cells, and the waste products, of course, are, are, are water and CO2 of, in normal cells. The cancer cells, they're, they're, they, they can't use that part of their metabolism has been corrupted uh, by any number of means, as I mentioned to you already, any number of things can corrupt the ability of the mitochondria to get energy through oxphos. So what does that leave them to get? How are they going to survive and grow without energy? They need energy. And that energy comes from, from glucose and glutamine. And um, yeah, there are some cancers where you can pull away all the glucose and they're still, th they're still thrive uh, and, and they're thriving on the glutamine. And there are some cancers that, that um, use mostly glucose but the majority of cancers use both, only because um, glutamine and glucose are the two most abundant fuels in the tumor microenvironment. I mean, there are other amino acids in the environment that can fuel a cancer cell. The problem is they're very little, they're, they're, there's much less logistics. It's a logistics supply issue. So if I'm gonna run an inefficient metabolism, I better have a large amount of fuel available to run this inefficient metabolism because it's not efficient. Therefore, there's a logistic issue. Where am I gonna get the fuel to run an in in inefficient system? And the answer is the fuel is readily avail available. As a matter of fact, we just published a paper uh, showing in brain cancer how the radiation and chemo of people with brain cancer free up massive amounts of glutamine and glucose in the microenvironment, which ultimately leads for the, to the rapid demise of these poor people. In other words, the very therapies that are being used to treat glioblastoma are contributing to the death of the patients, not only just the tumor, the very treatments themselves. And this can explain in large way, in large part, why so few people survive. They survive because the very treatments 
are freeing up massive mm. amounts of glucose and glutamine. So the tumors are always going to be growing. So, I mean, and, and this explains, it was a very big paper we just published on this whole thing. And, and so, so I, I think that a lot of people might not understand. So they, they think glutamine meal, though, they, they have some connection to food and nutrition. They think, okay, I'll just eat, stop eating protein con that contains glutamine. Um, not that simple, I would assume. Yeah, no, it's not that simple. Um, the body can make glutamine from other, that's why it's called a non-essential because the body can make it from, from things. You know, our muscles are loaded with glutamine. You know, part of the cachexia that people get uh, loss of weight despite the fact that they might be eating is the muscles release glutamine into the microenvironment and this can find its way to the cancer. Um, so, so you need a drug. Uh, we need, we need specific drugs. We've, we've shown that this, this, Glutamine antagonist, uh, um, six diazo nor norleucine, which is called D-O-N, Don, really does a good job in, in, in depriving the cells of, of glutamine. But it works so much better under therapeutic ketosis. So, so therapeutic ketosis not only, not only works together with the drugs, but it also facilitates drug to target. And um, so there's a lot of things that we need to know, uh, but the basic outline and the basic framework is in place, and I think it will. It's going to take time before the oncology field recognizes. Number one, cancer is not a genetic disease; it's a metabolic disease. And number two, you know how best do we treat patients using this new paradigm? Um, and this is obviously uh, going to take some time. Uh, but once people understand it and they realize how powerful it is and how effective it is, I, I think it's just it's just common sense that this is going to happen. Right. So. Obviously, the the non-essential glutamine is from like so your body can make it, but still your body needs it. So, would you just pop this drug in there every now and then to do sort of a targeted approach to it to not deprive the body completely of glutamine and, and yeah. block all of its reception? Or how do you? No, you're 100 percent right. This is what this is what we call the in our in our big paper we published called Press Pulse, a novel mm -hmm. strategy, which is exactly what you just said. You know, we're we're still in the as I said, we understand the framework. We understand the concepts. We we just have to work dosage, timing, and scheduling. You're absolutely right. Uh, glutamine is such an important amino acid. It runs our gut. It, it runs our immune system. It runs the urea cycles. I mean, we have a lot of physiological things going on that require glutamine. So we just can't go in there like a bull in the china shop and just rip out all the glutamine because you're going to harm the body. So it has to be done strategically. It has to be pulsed and used under certain conditions in certain ways. And this is what we're working on right now. Um, you know, this is what people say, well, this is not sexy science. No, it's not. It's, it's not sexy science, but it will actually resolve the disease if done correctly. So, um, and I think that's the ultimate goal. Isn't the ultimate goal to resolve the disease without toxicity? Right. The, the, the issue is doses, timing, and scheduling. And this is what we're, this is the cutting edge right now. And once we've figured this out on the preclinical systems, we can then immediately translate this into the, into the clinic. We're doing that now uh, in patients, but with my colleagues in, in different, in different uh, uh, countries, but we're, we're still not there with respect to the issues that you just rose. These are very important issues that need to be, need to be worked out, but we can, this is, we can do this. This is, is not an insurmountable problem. Right. And so is this sort of a, a mechanism, the glutamine production that why people say that, or it's commonly held that you should reduce a lot of protein consumption when you're doing any sort of cancer treatment, regardless of chemotherapy or not? Or yeah. are there other mechanisms here that we don't want to fuel a cancer growth through through that? Or can they pretty much only, as a fuel source, be using glucose or glutamine? Yeah, no, no. This is this is an important issue because um, uh, T. Colin Campbell had published some interesting papers in rat tumors where uh, protein content under a certain level was therapeutic, but when you reached a certain threshold where it went over, it could stimulate tumor growth. And and, and you have to realize that you know the, many of these proteins are broken down and they uh, to glucose. They they gluco they they're fuel for gluconeogenesis. So you can you can take the carbon structure of of, of protein, break it down to amino acids, and and glean uh, produce glutamine uh, glucose from that. So um, I'm I'm still not sure yet whether you know taking glutamine as part of the diet. There's a lot of cancer. This is interesting enough. A lot of cancer patients. Uh, are so beat up by by the toxic therapies, they're, they 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 take high dose glutamine uh, to recover their gut function, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and you know we're not yet sure whether whether that's going to be provocative to any surviving tumor cell. We we, we and, and it's another interesting thing. You can do hyperbaric oxygen 
Insurance companies cover hyperbaric oxygen to recover the damage from excessive radiation to the body, but they don't use, they will not cover hyperbaric oxygen to actually kill tumor cells. Like we, it's, it's kind of a crazy system. I, I, so, I'd be, yeah, I'd be interested to see, for instance, if, if the argument is that reduce protein intake so that way you don't have supply of glutamine or even glucose through gluconeogenesis and all these other factors, what, I mean, how much does your body release into your bloodstream when you, when your cachexa can start losing muscle mass? And then like, yeah, good point. Good point. We, we, we know, we know a lot of that goes to the tumor cells and that's what the tumor cells are sucking out your, that's why you're, you're, you're you know, cachexia, um, now cachexia is, is weight loss. Uh, because of a pathological situation, um, the tumor cell, the tumor is using energy from the body to grow at the expense of muscle and other tissues. So you're, you're, you're it's a path. And as a matter of fact, blood sugar and heat and insulin are high under cachexia. Can you believe this? Now, under therapeutic ketosis, when you stop eating or when you're doing these keto uh, calorie restricted ketogenic diets, insulin and blood sugar go way down. So that's what we call th uh, therapeutic body weight loss. It's a, it's a therapeutic state, whereas cachexia is a pathological state. So people, you know, have to realize body weight loss can be very therapeutic uh, in, one, in one context, but very pathological in another. And, you know, of course, many cancer patients, unfortunately, are poisoned and irradiated. Uh, and when I say poison, uh, the drugs that they use, these chemotherapeutic drugs, are, are actually poisons. Um, you know, they poison the body, they kill tumor cells too, but they poison your body. And, and of course you lose weight. I mean, you're sick, you're, you're vomiting, you have di diarrhea, all the, these are all indirect forms of calorie restriction, but it's, it, you're causing harm to the body and, and, and the weight loss is pathological. This is very different than therapeutic weight loss. So people have to get over this idea that, you know, weight loss is always bad. You know, weight loss can be powerfully therapeutic when done under the right context. So all of these things have to be have to be adjusted. And, you know, getting back to the two fuels, glucose and glutamine, a lot of people, um, uh, a lot, many people have said, oh no, cancer cells can burn fat. So in order to burn fat, you have to have healthy mitochondria. Mitochondria are beta oxidized, uh, or fats are beta oxidized in the mitochondria, and they gener generate energy through oxidative phosphorylation. But people say, well, I know cancer cells burn fat because I, I gave a lot of fat to the, to the animal and, 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 uh, and, and the tumors grew faster, or people. And, and I said, well, there's also a lot of glucose you have around, and there's evidence to show clearly that high fat diets, uh, not high fat diet, fat, fat itself can force the tumor to take in more glucose and glutamine through, through, through alternative mechanisms. So it appears that the fats are making the tumor grow faster, but if you have a significant amount of glucose and glutamine, the fat will make the tumor use more glucose and glutamine, but not, uh. not directly. So um, people have to realize the tumor cells can only burn glucose and glutamine. And we went through this in a big paper and showed that any other amino acid, you have to invest energy to get energy, whereas glutamine is pure gold energy for that cell. You don't have to metabolize anything. It just goes right, right through the glutaminolysis pathway and generates massive energy inside the mitochondria through a fermentation mechanism. So you shut the door on the glutamine and you shut the door on the glucose, most of those cells up and die very quickly. So, um, and the, the normal cells get very healthy. So this is the strategy. And as you mentioned, if you, if you do it right and you, you do it with the right dosage, timing and scheduling, you can degrade and, demo and demolish these tumor cells uh, quite effectively without harming the rest of the body. And, and you know, people want, want things like this. Right, and, and so to that point you just made, would you recommend only a calorie restricted ketogenic diet? Certainly not a, a, a one with calorie surpluses. Yeah, well, I've, we found in both the epilepsy, it was very interesting years ago, John Freeman, the late John Freeman, the, 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 one of the founders of the whole ketogenic diet for epilepsy thing, he told me, we had a conversation one day, and he said, Tom, whenever we find a kid uh, who really likes ketogenic diets, we can't manage his seizures. It doesn't work. So um, I, I found that to be a very interesting uh, observation. Every, you know, two, one out of 400 kids just loves to pour keto oil all over everything, and he's always he's got massive amounts. So we did it in the mouse. We gave mice as much uh, keto as they could have, uh, and, and we found they got insulin insensitivity and high blood sugar. So uh, um, uh, clearly too much of this stuff is, again, you it's a medicine. Uh, it's, it's like any medicine. If you don't use it correctly, you can have uh, effects that are, that are not quite as, uh, the, the, the approach is not quite as effective. So most people, humans, 
you know, they're not interested in eating massive amounts of ketogenic diet because the high fat in their blood triggers the eighth cranial nerve, which controls your appetite. So you, your appetite gets reduced. So you, overall, you're not consuming as much as you normally do. And some mice have this, some mice don't. So we always recommend calorie restricted ketogenic diet. As long as you can get into therapeutic ketosis, you should be okay. But again, if you eat too much of this, you get insulin insensitivity and high blood sugar, which can then contribute to the tumor growth. So again, we're working out these protocols now that will be adapted for cancer patients. And it makes things a little bit easier if we can follow the the, the, the pathway for um, ideal um, body metabolism. So it's, right. a, it's a work in progress. So an interesting question that I have is that you, you mentioned before how people can – for instance, in the seizure pathway that, you know, as soon as they eat, drink a Coke or eat a, eat a slice of pizza, they then have a seizure again, and it's not a complete fix in this stuff. As far as these cancerous cells, let's say you're doing this press pulse therapy for a long time. It shows that, you know, you're totally good, everything, you know, complete remission. And then you, you drink a soda or eat a pizza. Is, is everything going to come flaring back again in the same sort of parallel to epilepsy? No, it will not. And, um, and also there's several reasons. So, you have to realize most of the people that are taking ketogenic diets for epilepsy uh, are children and the parents are the over overseers and they are rigidly compliant. Why? Because no one wants to see their child going through an epileptic seizure. It's a, it's a traumatic kind of event for the child and for everyone in the room. So the parents know they keep those kids really compliant so they don't have to watch their child have a seizure. In, in cancer, you don't see that at all. You can't see a group of cells growing because you decided to have a Coke. Um, you don't see the same um, uh, visual effects of, of that in, in some in, internal tissue or organ. So, um, so you don't really know. But uh, we think that um, it doesn't nearly happen as quickly. You can't grow a whole bunch of cells real, real quick like you can have a, a blow, uh, what they call a breakthrough seizure, which is obvious. So – no, we don't. You know, we, we have patients that are people that are, you know, um, compliant. And every now and then they might have a pizza with water or a pizza with red wine. There's a certain ca alcoholic drinks that don't raise blood sugar. So um, but, you know, if people want to stay alive, they want to get get control of their of their of their tumor and they want to get control of their life. You know, they they pretty maintain. But, but I have to be honest with you. The human nature is amazing. We have people that tell us, oh yeah, I'm really, really compliant. I'm really, really. And then we look at their blood work and it's out of, out of whack. There's no way they could be compliant. So what they do is they lie. They, they lie to themselves and they lie to them just so they, to make them, to make somebody say, oh yeah, you're doing a good job. So, yeah, but when you're dealing with a, a, a glioblastoma or, you know, advanced lung cancer, I mean, you, there's not much wiggle room here. I mean, you want to stay alive. You got to kill those tumor cells. You got to be compliant. Right. And compliance is a, is a, is a problem for any kind of a medicine. I mean, there's a lot of people taking radiation and chemo that aren't, aren't compliant either. So um, compliance always represents a, a challenge if you if you really want to get complete control over the disease you're working with. Right. So I mean, you found the one the this Dawn to be effective at dealing with the glutamine pathway. I, I mean, are you guys adding in stuff like dichloroacetate or three bromopyruvate or anything like that to modify even more the glucose pathway with the pyruvate modifications? Or yeah, I th I think these are these are possibilities. I mean, it's it's you know, as scientists, we we have to be very careful about how we mix and match the drugs, um, just like you would do for any particular approach. You know, which drug, and we got to be careful because if we do do it too aggressively, we get again, harm, harm body because you, you start screwing with too many systems simultaneously. So we, we're trying to work in very low doses of these, of these kinds of drugs to work synergistically with the, with the diet state status. As I said, this is the cutting edge. This, this is the, where we need to be supported in, in doing these kinds of things, because ultimately what we're doing is, is defining the new protocol for cancer management. And um, yes, I mean, we, we can use uh, supplementary drugs and procedures that would work together uh, to further reduce glucose or the metabolic pathways that are involved. But, you know, we have to do this very, very carefully, uh, again, to avoid any kind of a, a damage or in, impediment of the, of the entire process. And most of this is basically trial and error. That's why we call it non, uh, people, people refer to it as non-sexy science, only because a lot of it involves trial and error. But but ultimately, the end result is that you will have a protocol 
that will be effective in managing the majority of cancers without toxicity. And right. I think there's a, there's a certain motivation to want to do that. <laughs> so, so if somebody's listening to this podcast, has cancer, wants to be treated in this way and not go through the ringer like they have been, I'm sure they go to their primary care physician or oncologist and explain this to them and they'll think they're a uh, psychopath. <laughs> Is your clinic the only one that's doing this type of stuff or where, where should people go or what should they do? This well, first of all, first of, yeah, well, first of all, I don't have a clinic. I, oh, I'm they said at the clinic that I, I'm a professor at Boston college. Right. So we don't, we don't even have a medical school here, but, but we, we work with, with people in, like in, in Istanbul, Turkey, uh, where they were the first major group to embrace the concept of metabolic therapy from the book that I wrote. And they're getting rather remarkable success mm. um, on using combinations of chemo drugs at low doses with hypothermia, hyperbaric oxygen, restricted ketogenic diets, the whole thing. And the patients are doing, in general, they're doing far better than, than, than most of the other clinics. Yeah, you're, you're, what you touched upon is probably one of the most difficult situations and frustrating situations. And that is people listen to what I have to say or what some of my colleagues have to say, and they run down to their uh, top medical school and their, or their oncologists and they say, well, this can't be right because I would have learned it in medical school. And no, they're not would have learned. It's not their <laughs> fault. Um, they've just simply were never trained to understand that cancer is a metabolic disease. They were not trained to understand Warburg, uh, Otto Warburg's central concept. And therefore, the very people that are supposed to provide the, the, the service to the patient are clueless as to the uh, why we're doing this in the first place. And they're all fear and weight loss. They're all, it's, it's the training of the physicians that needs to change. And I feel bad for all these cancer patients because they're running to their, and they get, and they get um, discouraged and told that this doesn't work. Bad, what doesn't work? Where, where's the evidence? Does it, I'll show you papers that it does work. Um, you know, but they just don't read the literature. They're not, they're not on top of the scientific literature. I mean, a lot of people continue to treat patients with Avastin. Now, Avastin was pulled off the market. It's an anti-angiogenic drug. And it was pulled off the market for breast cancer because it didn't work and it was harming people. And, you know, they still give it to brain cancer patients and other pa patients with other cancers. And we know that the tumor cell that will kill you doesn't care about angiogenesis and will grow faster with Avastin. Yet they continue to give people Avastin. And, and they don't read the scientific literature. You know, it's just... It's very frustrating to see what we're doing to all these cancer patients based on a fundamental lack of knowledge on the biology of the very disease that we're treating. So, so I, I don't know. It's, a, it's going to take a time uh, for this whole thing to pass. I mean, immunotherapies, they work great on some people, um, but they, they, they don't work and they could kill other people uh, faster than the disease itself. Right. So, so, I mean, and, but it's based on the gene theory. So when you say to, to the oncologist, are you giving me a treatment based on the metabolic theory of cancer or the genetic theory of cancer, they should give you an honest answer. And if they can't, then you have to say, well, what is this guy treating me for if he doesn't understand the biology of the problem? Right. Do you, have, then, any, do you have any rogue it, oncologists in the U.S. that you know of, or do you have like a list you're keeping well, somewhere? Well, it's, it's something we can't discuss because if, if physicians don't follow the standard of care, uh, they can lose their license. And therefore, there's a tremendous frustration on the part of the physicians who actually understand the concepts, but are not able to uh, uh, to administer this for fear that they they be treating patients with with uh, therapies that don't that that are that are not sanctioned. You know, I've spoke I just came back from um, from Switzerland, where we we had a big meeting on on metabolic therapies for all kinds of diseases, including cancer. And one of my physician friends treated a, a woman with um, stage four metastatic breast cancer with metabolic therapy, and she did remarkably well. I mean, this tumor shrunk. The, the, she was very healthy. Three years out, she's doing really well. And he was excited to present this to the, to the uh, oncology group in Switzerland. He was vilified uh, 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 because he didn't follow the standard of care. And, and the bot, but the, the patient is doing remarkably well. The fact that the patient was doing remarkably well was inconsequential to the fact to the fact that he chose to treat someone with a non-sanctioned procedure. Wow. And had anything gone wrong, he would have been thrown in jail. So not the fact that this woman is doing really well, but the fact that he didn't follow the instructions. So it's okay for people to die through an officially sanctioned procedure than rather to save the patient's life through an alternative procedure.
Can you believe this? It's crazy. So what if you were to diagnose the cancer tomorrow, would you just go to Istanbul and work at that clinic or what, what would be your approach? Well, of course, I, you know, we developed a lot of the things. And even though we did this, I still like to consult with a physician that knows, you know, the in, in, the in and outs of actually treating somebody. Um, I would know the concepts. I certainly, you know, would would follow what we've said. But nevertheless, I would still like to talk to someone who who would be, uh, you know, we, we don't want to go out and everybody just treat themselves. You, you, you've got to have a professional that understands the situation and can make recommendations that you in your pr- present state may not have thought about. And and um, and I think that's always. Yeah, I know exactly what I should do if I were to get cancer, but I still need a professional to talk about what I plan to do just so I would talk about uh, with him. And if something went this way or that way. We would have a conversation right. Uh, right. about what direction should should we go in. Now, I understand that the majority of people who who, who might have cancer um, need to rely on their on their caregiver with 100 percent confidence. Um, and for many diseases and many situations, that's absolutely essential. But when it comes to cancer, we have 1,600 people a day dying. And in China, it's 8,000 people a day dying. So clearly, we have a, a, an unrecognized epidemic of people dying from cancer. So obviously, there's some serious problem in the entire system that needs to be changed uh, radically. So, I mean, it sounds like you're getting a lot of physicians that are coming to you and saying, hey, I really want to do this or I've tried it out and it's working. It just they can't expand their scope or, or be very vocal about it. Yeah, well, sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. But you're absolutely right. I, I'm we're, we're trying to work on a global society for metabolic therapy with physicians that are being trained as quickly as possible and trying to uh, establish uh, an alternative standard of care based on on solid concepts. Uh, of metabolic approaches. But the issue, of course, is, is, is that we have to have a very powerful training session. We need to develop a protocol that's going to be um, adapted by the, by the majority of oncology clinics and that are going to be utilized for the majority of cancer patients. So there's a whole infrastructural uh, uh, system that needs to be put into place. But you're 100% correct. Most physicians have an intrinsic desire to heal and help their patients. And I think when they see the power of what metabolic therapy can do, they get so excited about this. And this is truly the art of practicing medicine because you can tweak things here and there and make the patient actually come into a better physiological state. And and this is what physicians do rather than what we do today is we just, you know, sit people down and inject them with a, with a certain dosage of poison that's not, that's strong enough to kill tumor, but not kill the patient. And, uh, or just irradiate some part of their body, you know, one, one, one size fits all. And, and that's, that's going to be history in the future because we can't continue to what we've been doing. It doesn't work for, the, for many people. And, and I'm not saying that standards of care today are completely ineffectual. They are. Many people are walking around today. They're so-called cancer survivors. But many, or if not most, of those people have paid a serious price for their new new state of, of remission. Their bodies have been beat to hell by radiation and toxic poisons. They now have all other, other kinds of health issues that they didn't have but for the fact that they survived poison and radiation or some other kinds of approach, toxic approach. So people pay a price for their, for their survival. And we think we can manage this whole disease quite effectively without toxicity if we, if we apply the right strategies, dosage, and timing with these metabolic therapies. Yeah. Sounds like there's a lot of work to do, Tom. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we have, we're on the right path. We just, right. you know, we just, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. But well, there's more, more work to be done in the infrastructural and, and, and approach than it is in the scientific approach. Interesting. Yeah. Um, huh. Well, lo- a lot of solutions out there. Um, thanks for taking the time. I really, really appreciate it. And where can folks find your work and maybe where you're active online? Um, well, we, we publish most of our papers in open access journals. Also on the CrossFit website, um, I've put in some, uh, been requested to put in some major discussions about cancer as a metabolic disease. So, uh, uh, the CrossFit, if you can go on there and see stuff on cancer, uh, but most of our papers are published in open access journals. People go online and see this. And if anybody would like to support the work that we do, uh, Travis Christofferson, um, who published uh, tripping over the truth, a very excellent book on the cancer uh, the cancer metabolic issue. Uh, he has a foundation called the foundation for metabolic therapies. And, uh, that money, 
uh, is donated to Boston College through a grant system at the university. So that supports our, our research. Individuals donate to Travis's foundation and then the foundation. Because I'll be honest with you, it's very, very difficult to get funding for things that actually can resolve the disease. But if you, you can get millions and millions of dollars to study gene signaling pathways uh, related to the disease or, or something that will may not have direct clinical relevance, you get a lot of money for those kinds of things. But actually trying to resolve cancer, very hard to get money, especially if it doesn't involve some some toxic drug or some yeah. immuno, immunotherapy or something like this. So to let people know, that you know you have an idea, but you know to, to get that idea fleshed out, it requires funds, and 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 funding this kind of stuff has been very very difficult. Well, thanks for doing all the work you do. Yeah, thank you. All right, everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of the Keto Answers podcast. 